Morning everyone and welcome to the first virtual annual public meeting of the Canal River Trust. Um, as it's virtual you're going to see some pre-records and some live action too from Richard and I. Hopefully you've uh, read the annual report and accounts, they're a riveting read and I hope you found them a riveting read. Um, as I said, because um, it is virtual, you'll see some pre-records, Julie talking about COVID, Simon talking about the reservoirs, Heather talking about the synthesis between waterways and well-being, and Richard will say a few words of uh, introduction. It's been a tough year and uh, for everybody actually, and I want to pay particular tribute to our people, to our volunteers, and to you, our supporters, because it's been a monumental achievement uh, to get us through uh, where we are. So, pre-records to start with, live Q&A. As I say, we're going to answer all your questions either live, Richard and I doing it, or we'll absolutely get back to you in terms of email. So with that, let me hand over to Richard. Thank you, Alan. I'm Richard Parry, Chief Executive for the Canal River Trust. Let me add my welcome to all of you for joining us today. Although it is late October, we're here to talk largely about our annual report for the year ending 31st of March 2020. We will, of course, provide an update on our progress in the past seven months, which, as Alan has already observed, have been an extraordinary period for all of us, which has, of course, significantly affected the Trust and our work. And at the end, we'll do our best to answer your questions about any aspect of our work. Steve Dainty, our Finance Director, will talk later about the financial results for the 2019-20 year. And I'm now going to share some other information about our performance. Turning first to visitors to and users of our waterways. Last year we refreshed our survey methodology to estimate more accurately our visitor numbers. And this indicates that an increased figure of circa 9 million people use our waterways or towpaths, demonstrating the reach that the Trust now has. The circles here showing the range of uses and their relative scale. Our user satisfaction scores show more than four-fifths of towpath users and two-thirds of boating customers satisfied with their experience. Our first responsibility is to care for the fabric of the waterways, to keep our network, its heritage and habitats, in good condition, safe and available. Simon will talk about our work on reservoirs later and I'm going to talk briefly about our other infrastructure. This graph shows that our DEFRA contract measure, an assessment of the overall asset condition which continues to improve year on year, reflecting the additional work we are doing. Major works last year include rebuilding Hurliston Lock on the Clangothan Canal and projects to strengthen embankments and reline the canal bed on sections of the Macclesfield and Lancaster canals. Our in-house direct labour teams delivered over 600 repair projects. On the downside we were badly affected by last winter's storms which inflicted damage across the north of England with over five million pounds of repair and rebuilding works needed before some waterways can fully reopen. Our DEFRA contract also includes a measure of towpath condition and that has continued to improve thanks in large part to the external funding we have secured right across the country as local authorities and others recognise the benefits gained for local people from funding work to help support more active lives and sustainable travel options. Notably in Yorkshire, where nearly 20 miles of improvements to towpaths were delivered last year. We have more new projects starting in 2020 as well. For example, along the Coventry Canal, ahead of next year's City of Culture. We've also progressed other enhancements to our infrastructure, including, with funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the impressive lock restoration work delivered by the volunteers on the Grantham Canal, and the massive Unlocking the Seven project to instate fish passes on the river's historic weirs, with excellent recent progress seeing the first one at Beverley recently completed. We also welcome the recent National Lottery Heritage Fund announcement of funding of the Cotswolds Canals Connected project and look forward to reconnecting the Stroudwater Canal to the Waterways Network. 
Our work, of course, goes beyond our basic asset management to make waterways attractive and welcoming places to visit, relevant and appealing to, and valued by, local communities. Having successfully secured Green Flag Awards status for 300 miles of canals, adding large sections of the Erewash and Leeds and Liverpool canals in 2019, I'm delighted to announce our success in securing the award for a further 100 miles of canals this summer, despite all the restrictions we've had to cope with, including in central Manchester, Liverpool and Nottingham, in East London, as well as the entire Monmouth and Brecon Canal in South Wales. Both our established Share the Space and Plastic Challenge campaigns have continued from last year into 2020 to encourage people to show respect for others and help us care for the waterways environment. Our amazing volunteer numbers continue to grow, reaching over 700,000 hours given in 2019-20. And whilst we have suffered very significant disruption to our volunteers' activities this year, their recent return is very encouraging. Our outreach to local communities through our Community Roots programme, funded by the People's Postcode Lottery, has also made great strides with a wide range of activities from let's fish to street art, canoeing to tree planting, all giving local people opportunities to get involved. We now have over 600,000 active supporters in addition to nearly 30,000 friends regularly donating and 85,000 school children took part in face-to-face -face activities through our Explorers programme, though that is one of several programmes suspended during the pandemic. As well as generating income, our property activity with our joint venture development partners included the creation of innovative and often award-winning housing schemes. And our roundhouse project in partnership with the National Trust, where construction and repair work has recently completed, ahead of a deferred opening next year. So, in summary, we've made progress across both our core work and the wider range of engagement activities that are vital to our future. And whilst 2020 has seen much of that work on hold or replanned, we remain confident of our capacity to regrain any ground we've lost as and when we emerge from this difficult period. I'm now going to hand over to Julie Sharman, our Chief Operating Officer, to talk through our health and safety performance and then say a little more about how we've responded to the challenges of the COVID pandemic. Before I do, let me just thank everyone involved at the Trust and with our waterways for the resilience and resolve they've shown. We've actually seen our colleague engagement results reach their highest ever as we pull together to come through these very difficult times. Good morning. I'm going to give you an update now on the Trust's health and safety performance for the last financial year. And I'll start with this riddle graph, which shows you the number of reportable injuries to colleagues volunteers and contractors over the last three years. The accident frequency rate is our key performance indicator for health and safety in the trust and for the last financial year the rate was 0.22 resulting from 12 reportable injuries in year. This was a fall from 0.29 in the previous financial year. Although an improvement on 2019 this is still more injuries than we want to see in the trust. We've been focusing on improved health and safety recording in the Trust and this graph shows that we recorded 511 incidents in the last financial year, which is up by 60% on previous years. This increased recording is a positive improvement as we actively capture more incidents that may not have been reported in the past. The single largest cause of incidents to members of the public are slips, trips and falls representing around 30% of all incidents recorded. Some of these public incidents relate to infrastructure and we analyse each report received and prioritise repairs. Last year we had 17 infrastructure related injuries compared to 34 the year before. We also undertake visitor risk assessments across our network and focus on areas with high visitor numbers. 
Sadly, last year, there were 50 deaths on or around our waterways. This was higher than the previous year, ending 2019, where 40 were recorded. Although these incidents fluctuate annually, we believe the increase in reporting is largely due to our interaction with the Water Incident Database, Wade, with whom we have started to share data within this financial year. In the Trust, health and safety is our priority and therefore we have actively focused on safety improvements in the last financial year and we continue to do so as we won't be satisfied with our performance until all our colleagues, volunteers and contractors go home safe every day. In the last financial year, some of our improvement initiatives include our Back to Basics campaign, which was launched across the Trust through our internal communications. We also launched our Health and Safety Awards last year to promote best practice sharing and held our third annual safety conference. We have doubled our health and safety representatives across the Trust who meet regularly through our six regional health and safety committees. And we have introduced management training through IOSH for all line managers. And we have continued our working relationship with Tribe Culture Change Consultants who are supporting our roadmap for improved safety culture within the Trust. We have undertaken external audits relating to visitor safety at our museums and attractions, as well as carrying out many visitor risk assessments at our popular visitor destinations. We have also worked with partners, the Royal Life Saving Society's Don't Drink and Drown campaign, and recorded an impactful water safety video with Nick Pope, the father of Charlie Pope, who sadly drowned following a night out in Manchester. We also produced a new tunnel safety video in partnership with our navigation advisory group and we improved our health and safety induction process for all new colleagues. It's been an extraordinary year for everyone as a result of the COVID pandemic. I'm going to run through some slides explaining the Trust's response to the pandemic now. Lockdown commenced on the 23rd of March at this point, the Trust limited all operations to essential activities only and navigation was suspended. Our towpaths remained open throughout the lockdown period and it was two months later that the lockdown was lifted and navigation could restart again. We saw a real shift in the pattern of towpath use during the lockdown. There was a significant increase in local use within urban and metropolitan areas, such as the Black Country, Pennine, Lancashire, Milton Keynes, by example. In these areas, many people living within a kilometre of our local waterways do not have access to private gardens. And that, combined with the lack of alternative green space in many areas, meant the canals became a vital lifeline for communities, providing safe and accessible places on people's doorsteps for daily exercise. In some areas, use rose to around 250% of normal, and on the odd days during lockdown, some sites recorded more than six times their normal use. Conversely, in some of the city centre locations, use fell substantially, particularly around parts of London Paddington and central Birmingham. We reviewed all our towpath locations in terms of risk assessment and installed thousands of signs during the lockdown to limit towpath use to local people. And as lockdown lifted, we refreshed our signage to include the key social distancing information. We also reviewed all of our facilities to ensure they were COVID safe while remaining accessible to those who needed to use them. We have also worked to support businesses, partners and customers. At the peak of lockdown, we had over 600 colleagues on furlough leave. Most returned by July, except for some specific roles. As activities restarted, we drafted and published our COVID risk protocols and undertook COVID risk assessments for all key tasks. From the end of July, we carefully planned the reopening of our museums and attractions and achieved the Visit Britain Good to Go accreditation. Volunteering was mainly suspended until July, but we now are very pleased to have over a thousand of our regular volunteers back to their regular duties. It was a priority through lockdown to remain in touch with our volunteers. And so we established a program of seminars to promote that ongoing engagement. These continue. As we came back to work, we held small local events outdoors to welcome back our colleagues and volunteers. 
Throughout the crisis, we checked in on our people via engagement and well-being surveys. Our engagement score rose to 74% in both colleagues and volunteers. In terms of well-being, 80% of our colleagues were very satisfied with the Trust's approach. Understandably, people do have concerns and are feeling detached from their colleagues as a result of the COVID pandemic and working from home. Overall, as we now face into a winter with further restrictions, we believe we have, as a trust, coped well with the challenges we have faced from the pandemic. However, like everyone, we remain optimistic that there will be a resolution so we can look forward to a new year of normality. Good morning. I'm Simon Bamford, Asset Improvement Director at the Canal and River Trust. In my presentation today, I will give an update on the works at Tobruk Reservoir following the spillway failure last year and the work we are doing for the new spillway. I will also provide an insight into the de developments we have made in reservoir management and risk reduction. At Tobruk, we have completed the temporary works required to ensure that the reservoir is compliant with the Reservoirs Act in terms of its ability to safely pass the one in 10,000 year storm event until the permanent repairs are completed. The temporary works have included the construction of a concrete cut-off connected into the clay core, a new raised weir as seen in the picture here, reinforcement of the damaged area and repairs to the spillway. During the storm event of July 2019, the reservoir inlet structure was damaged and so required repairing and modifying to divert as much water as possible into the bywash channel. The reservoir is kept empty by the diversion of water into the bywash, but in high rainfall, when water enters the reservoir, the pump system kicks in to remove the excess water and discharge it to the river. The permanent repair for the inlet has been designed and will potentially include a footbridge to create a circular walk around the reservoir subject to liner, landowner access agreement. We have appointed Arup as design consultant for the new spillway and other works and over the last few months they have developed 13 spillway options which were reduced to a short list of two to be further investigated and developed. Ecological, geotechnical and other investigations for the two shortlisted options and a public consultation virtual and in person have been done and we're currently reviewing the feedback which will be factored into the selection and development of the preferred option. One of the key elements of the two shortlisted options for the new spillway is that they are located at either end of the dam, away from the highest section at a position where they would be founded on original undisturbed ground. The first option at the left hand end of the dam is what's known as a bathtub weir where water spills over three sides of the structure which then passes in front of the sailing club, through the part below the dam and into the river Goit. A more refined alignment of the spillway has currently been developed. The second shortlisted option at the right hand end of the dam is what's known as a tumble bay weir where water spills over one side of the structure. The spillway would pass through the woodland below the dam, through the park and into the river Goit taking a principally straight route to the river. In preparation for selection of the preferred option, we are gathering data from ground investigations, environmental surveys, consultation feedback and ongoing stakeholder discussions, together with option pricing and the identification of access options. Once the data gathering and evaluation is complete, we will select the preferred option to be discussed with the planning authority in preparation for a planning consent application in spring 2021 with the outline design being developed during the winter months. We're planning for the construction of the new inlet works to start in spring 2021 with spillway construction starting in autumn 2021 subject to planning conditions. A few years ago the Trust commenced a process known as Risk Assessment for Reservoir Safety, or RAS, which is an industry tool that enables us to analyse and assess reservoir risk and identify necessary actions such as data collection, 
physical investigations or the undertaking of works. The Trust has 71 reservoirs covered by the Reservoirs Act and all were subject to the RAS process with an initial Tier 1 qualitative risk assessment being undertaken. We started Tier 2 quantitative assessments last year, the outputs of which are confirming actions already in plan and identifying further actions to ensure risks are as low as reasonably practicable. The types of actions generated by the Tier 2 assessments include works already in plan and we have a programme of repairs and improvements such as valve replacements, spillway repairs and upgrades and drainage. Secondly, undertaking desk and site studies such as catchment and rainfall and geotechnical investigations and finally capital works to reduce risk such as installing siphons to increase drawdown capacity. Over the past year we have had a programme of activities designed to actively manage and reduce risk. A key element of which has been the increase of resources in our reservoir asset team. We have completed the first phase of the Tier 2 assessments and are progressing well with Phase 2. An important part of reservoir management is the undertaking of what are known as surveillance visits, which occur several times a week by a surveillance inspector. The findings of these visits used to be recorded on paper, but are now digitally captured on mobile devices and immediately uploaded into our systems for review and reporting. We've also completed a programme of refurbishment projects and enhanced vegetation management. Finally, over the next five years, we will be investing over £70 million in our reservoirs, delivering our core reservoir programme and additional risk reduction works, together with the increased use of technology for reservoir management, such as trials to evaluate the use of satellite technology to enhance our remote monitoring of dams and reservoir structures. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Heather Clark, the Strategy Engagement and Impact Director at the Canal and River Trust. And I will be presenting a short update on our outcomes measuring and reporting activities. Since we published our first outcomes report in late 2017, we have been building our capability and putting in place the infrastructure needed to enable us to capture and evaluate our outcomes generated. We know that we can't afford to expend resources intensively everywhere on the network, so we've selected nine metropolitan and urban areas across England and Wales where we're concentrating our community engagement and outreach efforts in order to showcase and evaluate how waterways can contribute to individual and community well-being. In autumn 2019, the Trust recruited Community Roots Officer for each of these areas to lead on our community engagement and outreach activities and to work closely with local partners, charities, faith groups in these areas. This programme of activity is supported by People's Postcode Lottery. We are currently working with graphic designers on finalising our second outcomes report, which will be published shortly. This new outcomes report is divided into three parts. The first section provides an overview of waterways and wellbeing. The second sets out our route map for measuring and reporting outcomes and how we've been aligning with government guidance and research sector best practice. The third section of the report comprises of a suite of technical appendices. We've included briefs from research projects that we're commissioning, summary of our published and unpublished research reports that we've commissioned to date. We've included primary tools that we've used in practice and lessons that we've learned from how we've used them. We have been and are working with partners from across academia as well as economists, behavioural scientists and social research specialists on a wide range of insight, research, evaluation, activities and our key findings to date are included within the technical appendices of our second outcomes report. So what have we learnt so far? Well, we now have a greater understanding of our potential reach and impact through our detailed demographic profiling and plotting community infrastructure. For example, we now know where the location of all the schools and doctor surgeries within a five to ten minute walk from our waterway 
in order to help us focus our efforts and resources to make the greatest difference and impact. Waterways as blue spaces and blue infrastructure have a role to play in helping to address challenges faced by this country, arising from the national crisis on health, biodiversity and climate change. As well as responding to urban green space deficit, the lack of private garden space highlighted by the recent national lockdown, and in providing access to nature on the doorstep to many urban communities. However, the delivery of wellbeing outcomes is underpinned by having infrastructure resilience and beauty of place. It's imperative that we continue to invest in the waterways infrastructure and tackle broken window syndrome so that our waterways are safe and inviting places to use. That is why our ambition to have all of our urban waterways being awarded green flag status is so important to us. Blue Health is a pan-European research initiative set up in 2016, led by the University of Exeter and the European Centre of Environment and Human Health to investigate the links between urban blue spaces, climate and health. This project has explored how to access urban blue spaces such as canals and rivers and how they've affected recreational use, physical activity and mental well-being, particularly those in, from poor households. Their findings have included significant improvement in well-being and mood for those walking through urban blue spaces. This research initiative has significantly informed our own thinking, positioning, research and interventions. Our own well-being evaluation study conducted by Symmetrica analysed the effect on subjective well-being of waterway usage to estimate the equivalent annual income that would be required to produce the same well-being effect as each visit to a waterway. And it is valued to be worth equivalent of £3.8 billion. Pounds. We launched last month the Urban Mind Citizen Science app in collaboration with the King's College London to gather data on the correlation between the environment, including being by water, and well-being. We are working to establish the value of waterways to the prosperity of the nation. We commissioned a state preference valuation study on the value placed on local people on the day-to-day -day waterways heritage. That's things such as our historic bridges and locks, which create the unique character of our blue spaces. We have also worked with the London School of Economics to examine property price premiums over the last 15 years and have been exploring the value of waterside regeneration using trust schemes and our own joint venture schemes as case studies. We are jointly commissioning a study with British Marine to establish the economic value of inland marine economy. Since publishing our first outcomes report we expanded our research and insight work and revisited our outcomes measurement framework to incorporate planetary well-being, particularly in relation to urban heat islands. Research conducted by the University of Manchester has assessed the extent to which our canals contribute to cooling of urban areas. The findings have revealed that the canals will increasingly have an important role to play in urban areas. The study found, for example, that the Rochdale Canal has a cooling effect of 1.6 degrees within a 100 metre wide corridor during the hottest days of the year. And in London, the cooling effects is 0.8 degrees up to 1 degrees Celsius. The role of waterways in active travel is also growing in importance and value, with walking being the most low carbon and equitable form and is at the top of the sustainable transport hierarchy. Finally, we've been developing our Sustainability and Climate Action Programme, supported by People's Postcode Lottery and a full evaluation plan. I hope that the presentation given to you provides an overview of the breadth of our activities and highlights the increasingly the role that waterways play in society today and can play in the future and giving you a preview of our forthcoming outcomes report. Thank you for listening and keep safe. Hello everybody. 
My name's Steve Dainty and I'm the Finance Director for the Canal and River Trust. I want to take a few minutes now to talk about our results for our last financial year, which ended in March 2020. You'll note that coronavirus was only declared a global pandemic on the 11th of March, and so its impact on our finances for the year ended was limited. On my final slide, I will make a few comments about the past half year and the financial impact of coronavirus on the Trust. As you can imagine, closing the year end under lockdown was a challenge and so I want to take the opportunity to extend my thanks to the finance team here at the Trust and our auditors BDO. Thank you. I'm pleased to say that the annual report is now available for download from our website. Now to give some detail about the numbers. First, the income statement. Income was £6 million higher than the preceding year, or £12 million after adjusting for the sale of BWML in December 2018. The increase was mainly due to our EU-funded Unlocking the Seven project to construct fish passes on the River Severn. Investment income was negatively impacted at the very end of the year due to dividend cancellations due to coronavirus. Other sources of income were modestly higher and it's also worth noting that we closed out an improvement to one abstraction agreement during the year and so utility and water development income was improved as a result. Expenditure on raising funds was broadly flat year on year after adjusting for the sale of BWML that I've already mentioned. Charitable spend meanwhile at almost £170 million was higher mainly as a result of the Unlocking the Seven project I mentioned earlier. You'll also see that we've taken the opportunity to separately identify our expenditure on Toddbrook. Here we've charged £24.4 million, of which around £5 million has been incurred in the year, principally on containment costs, with the balance our best estimate of the cost to complete repairs at the reservoir over the coming years. Moving further down the income statement, gains on investment finished the year slightly positive. It's worth clarifying that these are unrealised gains, mainly resulting from changes to the market value of our property investments, and although over 90% of these were independently valued, this was against the backdrop of coronavirus. It remains to be seen how the valuation of these properties will be impacted in the future, although the early signs are positive. We've included additional disclosures in our report this year to help the understanding of those valuations. These are in line with disclosures provided by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Perhaps surprisingly, we benefited from 43.5 million of pension actuarial gains, this was mainly because lower forward-looking inflation expectations reduced the value of the scheme's liabilities. Putting all of this together, the Trust benefited from a £30.8 million increase in funds compared to the start of the year. This slide shows further detail about the Trust's income on the left and charitable expenditure on the right, and I won't cover it in detail. It's copied directly from the Finance Review in our annual report. Note the diversification of our income, which has really been a strength for us, Within that, the Unlocking the Seven project forms part of third-party income from charitable activities, the dark blue section, where we saw the biggest increase year on year. On the expenses side, you can see within Infrastructure Works, the costs of Toddbrook, which I've already mentioned. Now moving on to our balance sheet. Overall, our balance sheet at year end was strong, with net assets increasing by £30.8 million versus the prior year. Breaking that number down, we slightly increased our tangible fixed assets as we took the opportunity to buy rather than lease some of the pumping and other equipment which we'll need at Toddbrook until repairs are complete. We also, as I've already mentioned, saw a modest growth in our investments. Our current assets and liabilities are heavily impacted by the timing of our large projects as well as timing of acquisition and sale of property investments. The £152.4 million is as a reminder, loan notes which are repayable from 2043 onwards. Moving down the balance sheet, the £27.2 million of provisions chiefly comprising future Toddbrook costs, which I talked about on the earlier slide, and the pension liability recognising our balance sheet was lower as a result of the inflation impacts noted earlier. You'll also note that we split our net assets into unrestricted and restricted funds. Restricted funds represent mainly the assets placed into trust by the UK government when we were created in 2012. There are a lot of restrictions around what we can do with those funds, which I won't go into, but in effect, the 20 to £6.8 million pounds of unrestricted funds are those which are freely available to us. Our annual report has all the details for those that are interested, and these arrangements remain unchanged from previous years. In effect, as a relatively new charity, we haven't yet had the opportunity to build significant unrestricted funds, and so broadly speaking, we have to ensure each year we earn what we spend. 
Finally, I think it's important to also make a few comments about the period since year end, how the coronavirus pandemic has impacted us financially and what we're doing about it. Well, it's been quite a year so far for all of us, and this is doubly true for the charity sector, who've seen reducing incomes at exactly the same time as organisations like ours are more important than ever. This has placed a significant strain on many charities' financial resources. For us here at Canala River Trust, we've also been impacted, but because of our lower dependency on charitable contributions and our high level of income diversification, the impact in the short term has been manageable. Notwithstanding these impacts, we've worked hard throughout the past few months and continue to do so to support our partners and customers. We expect that this year our income will be impacted by around 10%, which comprises reduced investment returns from our endowment, principally rental income from tenancy in our property portfolio. We've also, like many other charities, seen a reduction in charitable giving. And finally, of course, the assistance we've given to our boating customers in the form of licence extensions and other support is also having a negative impact on our income. On the cost side, we've needed to pay even closer attention than ever to the way we spend our resources and have been able to take some advantage of the government's furlough scheme. Although, even with this government support and other cost savings we have been able to make, we still expect to report a small deficit when we close out the current year. We also took the opportunity to renew and extend our financing facilities ahead of lockdown and based on our current plans expect to have sufficient liquidity for at least the next 12 months. It may come as no surprise to learn that the longer term position is less clear. We do know that investment income comprises around 30% of our total income and the long term prognosis for returns on those investments is not clear with the majority opinion that these will be lower in future than they have been in the recent past. In addition, our small but growing charitable income has been knocked back with our friends numbers, those who give regularly to the Trust, losing around two years growth in the past half year. We expect other funding sources to be negatively affected with many competing priorities over the next few years. We will therefore need to carefully manage our resources in line with our means over the medium to long term. Thank you. Good. Um... I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, we're now at the uh, live piece um, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the meeting. Um, and this is where we're going to try and do the Q&A. Um, those of you that have um, tried to chair these uh, meetings or any meetings actually on, on, um, on the iPad or the computer virtually all know that you all had to become jugglers. Um, you know, juggling has become one of the key attributes required of, of chairman. And, and to give you some idea, I've got Richard here. Uh, who I can see um, and I can just about hear. Um, on my screen to the right, I've got um, basically a WhatsApp with questions on it. To my left, I have an iPad um, with some more points and questions on it. And I have to have my phone to the left of me anyway, just in case any of this fails. So we're going to give this a, a really good go. Um, we've got some really good questions. Had, um, we had questions come in and obviously we're going to get some questions coming in live. I'm going to try and group them. Uh, and and then I'm going to fire them over to Richard and between us we'll try and answer them. What we are definitely going to do, anybody who's asked a question will get an answer. Either we'll do it verbally today or we'll send you an email. So um, let's see how we get online. So the first chunk of questions really, we've got uh, Alan in Grimsby, who's a boater, who's really saying what are we doing about speeding cyclists and how can we get them to respect the space more? I've got a question from Julie, which is about habitat loss. You know, can we make sure that the urban infrastructure that we're responsible for, we're still going to, you know, maintain? And 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 thirdly, we've got from Ian uh, McCarthy, uh, who really asked a similar question, which is say yes, and we've got all the wildflowers, but sometimes, you know, what he calls the mad axe man, the cutters and strimmers come and chop all the bits and pieces down. So some some cyclists speeding and habitat questions, Richard. You. Thank you, Alan, and, and good morning, everyone, coming live. Um, yes, some topics there that uh, we often spend time discussing. So on the first one around around cyclists, I'm Alan, I'm sorry to hear about your experience, and sadly, I, I do know it's not an uncommon experience. Um, we, we get uh, many complaints over social media, etc., about such things. But I do also know that there are very many cyclists who do act responsibly, um, and it's important we don't stigmatise everyone um, in this in this subject. And um, we have, as you may know, been working for several years on a share the space campaign to encourage all users 
particularly, but not just cyclists, to show respect and consideration for others, because the towpath is a very special and precious place. And I, I am convinced, I remain convinced, that it has to be through such firm and clear messages, backed up by sort of peer pressure in, the, in, the, in society, that will change the behaviour of the minority who don't respect other users and the shared towpath environment. Um, we continue this, and we've recently launched a new Stay Kind, Slow Down behaviour change campaign, which is aimed specifically at those cyclists going too fast, but with that message for all users. You know, we backed it up with clear signage, a firmer, I think, more direct signage, and targeted social media. And we're working increasingly with partners, uh, Sustrans, Cycling UK, you know, bodies like that are very important in influencing those we're trying to reach. And the clear message we're putting out is that pedestrians, uh, those angling, those mooring boats, etc., must have priority and that others must you know, regulate their speed and be careful around them. I know we won't change this overnight. There is really no panacea with a you know, 2,000 mile network and all the, the, you know, the hundreds of thousands or millions even of users, but we're determined to continue delivering these very clear and firm messages. We are undertaking pilots of other me measures, including traffic calming, but of course we don't want to turn towpaths into obstacle courses that impede all users, particularly those in wheelchairs, mobility impaired, those pushing buggies, or, or indeed those very many sensible cyclists. Um, and of course, we know this challenge of how you share space isn't unique to our towpaths. There are many others, local authorities, local parks, uh, etc. So we want to work with others to share best practice to find ways in which we can promote joint solutions and campaign collectively. If I turn to Julie's question, it, it is really important that we sustain these green corridors through our, our urban areas. Julie, I'm really pleased to hear you sort of raise that. It's vital to support wildlife, and we, and we know it's vital for the well-being of local people. And creating these nature networks, you know, all the, 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 the evidence suggests that's really important. Uh, over a third of our waterways are designated nationally or locally for wildlife, or landscape value, and we are increasingly working with partners to improve the quality of these of these sites and where we can often involving volunteers for whom working you know with the environment making a difference in their communities is a real motivation so we are committed to continue to offer space for wildlife we do take that into account when planning our works we know clearly we have to support the navigation we have to make towpaths safe for people to, to to access and to use but we must also protect the wildlife. Yeah, we, we have had a very um, active and a good dialogue with Natural England about the government's commitment to a nature recovery network in the UK, DEFRA's 25 year environment plan, etc. And it's very clear that our urban waterways, particularly all our waterways, can play a significant role in this. Uh, our trailblazing wild in Birmingham project taking you know, networks through the centre of that city every little patch of land that we can find to put a very planned uh, interventions our linear orchard but other other uh, habitats that are good for wildlife shows what you can do with uh, with that sort of care and attention and we're determined to continue making that something we want to bring to every urban space uh, that we're responsible for and finally to answer ian's question it's always a challenge to strike the right balance here i mean like so many of the things you do it is a question of balance you know with that 2000 mile network to manage we have to make sure that we you know we stay on top of the vegetation so people can safely access and use towpaths um, but of course we really do value uh, all the that, all that sort of wonderful wildlife diversity the, the wildflowers that grow etc uh, and we know people really value that. So we try to work with fountains, our contractor, to ensure those areas are, are, are protected so people don't see wildflowers sort of cut back when they're in their prime. But of course, it's 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 very difficult to apply that, uh, that sort of overall resolution consistently across all 2,000 miles. So we try, we try and find the balance. Uh, we do want to, I think, air more on the side of nature, but of course that's going to mean people accepting that the towpath environment may sometimes be a little bit more wild and we, you know, we'll sort of continue a dialogue with our users to ensure we take account of visitors' views locally where there's particular sections they cared about, um, but just generally across the network so that we make it an attractive place to come where the sort of uh, wildflowers people want to see can grow, but we still keep on top of the vegetation so it looks tidy and well managed. Alan, back to you. Good. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, second tranche, really. Um, first of all, we've got Anna, who's talking about the positive experience she's having as a continuous cruiser, but she wants to know what we're doing to improve rubbish collection and the waste facilities. Um, Glyn Thomas um, uh, said he was with his family on the Oxford uh, on a hire boat, and it was a bit spoiled because 
um, there was some vegetation overgrown, a lot of you know abandoned and 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 sort of wrecked um, vessels blocking uh, some of the mooring sites. Um, you know, what are we doing about that? Can't we have more enforcement people? Um, and then there's, a, in, there's sort of generally got quite a few questions about dredging, which is so you might want to just do a, a little update on where we are on a, on a dredging perspective. OK, Alan, will do. Um, first of all, um, good to hear the feedback from Anna about enjoying the boating. Um, we do provide facilities where, where you know where there's uh, sort of they're available um, do try and make sure they stay operational um, particularly in, in in the busy urban areas like London that proves quite a challenge um, we do have continual sort of uh, repair visits to keep them in service um, and it's very hard to find new sites with um, such little canal side space available in the inner uh, urban areas so um, very conscious that we need to continue to do the very best we can to increase and improve provision where we can. But we do already spend a lot of money keeping facilities in service, particularly where they're used so intensively. Um, and we'll continue to do our best with our contractors and, and partners to, to achieve that. Um, turning to Glyn's feedback, it's always disappointing when you hear um you know feedback like that about um a boating trip you know a hire boat a holiday particularly um we know offside vegetation is an ongoing challenge we spend an awful lot of uh, time and effort working on that with our contractors but also with local volunteer groups who can increasingly are helping us make a real difference in keeping on top of that it seems to be more prolific every year whether that's partly the climate and the more warmer uh, wetter weather that encourages it to grow, but certainly it seems to be a problem that you know, no matter how much uh, money we spend on it, it always seems to come back uh, stronger the following year. So to take the feedback. We know the Oxford's had some particular challenges in terms of the uh, issues around around boats. Well, first of all, you know, we do have very high uh, compliance with licensing. Over 96 percent of boats have a valid license from our very extensive surveys. Um, it's frustrating they don't all show their license they they should do they don't always um and of course we can't really do anything about the appearance of boats you know if if uh, if a boat is 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 a, is a bit less tidy a bit less well presented than others well that's very much um you know the choice of of, of that boat owner um and we do try and make sure that, uh, that any boats regardless of of how it looks doesn't uh, monopolize visitor mooring sites, et cetera. Um, that's something we, we try and have some uh, active enforcement around, but it clearly boats uh, may stay slightly longer than they should do, and that's disappointing. And really, we want boaters to show consideration for each other, really, and, and make sure that they don't dominate those sites. Um, and where they're busy, we try often again through sort of volunteers helping us keep a track of things. Um, but it's an ongoing challenge to keep them free and available. So I'm sorry that that, that, that wasn't your experience on the Oxford. Um, if boats cause a danger to navigation or they're, they're very much in the way, then we, we will act. But uh, the nature of our uh, legal powers really depend upon people uh, persistently offending before we can take very strong action against them. So largely it's about encouraging people to uh, show the same sort of respect that I talked about earlier on the towpaths, really, and to uh, and to allow other boaters to uh, enjoy their boating as well. And, and finally, on dredging, um, it's uh, quite a lot of science actually goes into the dredging. We have uh, some sections of waterway we know we need to dredge regularly, particularly the rivers or where we have um, uh, sort of waters are flowing into into our waterways because that deposits silt and can build up. So our program sort of takes account of that. Um, and also we do regular hydrographic surveys, so I won't get too much into the into the science of it, but we, we look at sort of sections of the waterway. We look at how uh, the extent to which the uh, the surveys we take using you know, technology uh, doesn't meet the, the minimum criteria and those uh, locations where the, uh, the, the, the performance, if you like, is worst, become the priority for dredging. So we do look around the network. We kind of plan a year or two ahead looking at those areas where uh, the compliance is worst and work through it systematically like, like that. That can mean that some sections won't get dredged for many years, but where there is a need, we will certainly attempt to prioritise it within the limits of the funding that we have available for this. Um, and of course, we do listen to feedback. So when people tell us there's a particular problem and we get a pattern of, of feedback, then that will be something we will, we will look at to prioritise as well. 
Um, we can sort of share the details of, of what we're what we're looking at in the uh, in the year ahead. Um, but certainly, we do try and respond. And in fact, sometimes we have to respond. If we get very bad flooding, like we saw in the north of England last winter, that that does mean we have to sometimes change our plans because. Yeah, if, if there's an extensive flooding that can cause a lot of silt to suddenly be deposited in the canals or the rivers. And that means we really do have to move to prioritise those sections if they are to be navigable at all. So it's uh, pretty dynamic uh, that we, the work we do is pretty dynamic in ensuring that we take the feedback from the surveys, take the feedback from customers, but also have to respond to um, events like that to uh, make sure that we keep our rivers, our canals as available to use as we possibly can recognizing that you know keeping them dredged is is something that's uh, that's vital for boaters if they are to enjoy it good thank you richard um the, then there's a, quite a few questions which are really all about um what's the impact of corona on our winter works and how that may um you know spread uh, into the summer um and then particularly Anne and Ollie Sagar I've got a couple of questions around the stuff that we did. Um, first of all, we, we were doing alerts by email, I think, and the sort of word is that, that that's going to stop and the continuous cruises, I think they find that very useful. Can, can we confirm where we are with that? And then also the expansion on the booking online, uh, particularly for certain tunnels, uh, and, and they think that may make life a little bit more difficult. So do you want to comment on Corona on works and and uh, you know some of the stuff that we've done and, and what we're going to continue to do and what we're not. Sure, Alan. Thanks. On winter works, first some reassurance: we're, we're still doing uh, uh, an extensive winter works program because we had some disruption earlier in the year. Of course, we've done a little bit of replanning, um, but we're doing a full program, about forty-five million pounds worth of spend. I think it's something like one hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty um, sites where large-scale repairs are being done, lock gates installed, repaired, etc. So that's still happening. Stoppages, um, I don't think we are um, doing anything to uh, uh, to stop the stoppages alert um, because we know how, how valued it is. And it's good to hear the feedback that, that uh, Anne and Ollie benefit from it as well. Um, so that will continue. So I can, I can hopefully uh, kill off that rumor. And indeed, we are looking to improve our communications. We, we're doing um, a lot of work at the moment to implement a customer relationship management system that will help us have a much more uh, comprehensive understanding of you know all of our customers and that will enable us to hopefully be better you know improving on our communication as well so it should get better certainly not something we'd want to reduce and finally the subject of, of, of booking online for sort of tunnels and other things um we do ask boaters to book passage in advance for some you know, tidal and river locks and, and certain lock flights and long tunnels. Um, it, it helps us to, to, to make sure we resource properly, respond to customer need. Um, and we think increasingly that by booking online, it just makes it more efficient, more practical, uh, relies less on sort of local uh, arrangements. So we know we've got to make this work for customers, but we think that provided we deliver it and it's accessible and available, it should be something that people can access relatively easily. Um, I know it's a change, but you know we're going to try and make sure it's an effective change and that it leads to a better and more efficient service. Okay. Um, now the the next subject is really all about London and London mooring, basically. Um, and the sort of questions go around a bit like this. It is so we did a London mooring strategy and, you know, did that get delivered? Did the you know, facilities and boring um, and moorings and, and booking of moorings take place? And is there some sort of breakdown of what, you know, what was achieved there, what was successful, what wasn't? Um, and then that leads into another load of questions, which are all about the consultation that we just started on managing the areas of high boating demands. You know, why, in short, why are we doing it now? Um, there's a view that the London boat numbers are going down. That may have a longer term effect. So, you know, why would you do it now? And then Sophie um, asks a very particular question about why we've not given any financial lenience to any of our London mooring um, holders or the boating businesses during coronavirus. I mean, you know, she believes that it attracts thousands of tourists and visitors um, to the canal. That's part of what we ask, you know, what we're trying to do. But in her view, we sort of failed them uh, in a crisis. 
So do you want to pick up on those, Richard? Yeah, thanks, Alan. I perhaps might take this in reverse order because the, the, the latter one is one I, I'd want to speak to immediately in that, you know, we have helped, um, I think, all the boating businesses that have had disruption across the network. And if there are any that you're aware of, Sophie, that haven't, then then please do make sure they're talking to their local boating business manager. You know, we have um, had uh, license fee suspensions. We've we've worked with uh, with tenants, so we've very much tried to sort of uh, help those businesses through this period. Um, so I'd be concerned if there were businesses that weren't. We know that the disruption has been very, very major for some business, some more than others. We saw some of the businesses get back into operation for the peak summer um, and actually trade quite well. But we know that others that had a different operating model that would have been less easy, you know, less able to social distance on board, et cetera, that they weren't able to start up. So we, we've certainly tried to be very mindful and to help all those businesses. So. If we if, if if you think there are some that we haven't reached please please do urge them to talk to us we did of course campaign to encourage dedicated government financial support it was disappointing that we were unable to secure support for the waterway sector specifically but i am aware that many businesses have been able to access some of that general government support so again um if if, if, if that's an option for people still uh, I would obviously hope that's available. Coming back to the, the, the big questions then about the London Mooring Strategy. So the London Mooring Strategy was adopted after a lot of, of work and consultation and discussions in 2018. And it had a range of actions in it, some that would be relatively quick, but some that would always going to take a number of years to implement. So it's very much a programme that, that had a sort of a, a long term aspect. So a lot's been done. The bulk of the remaining actions will largely be done in 2021. Um, there's a lot, lot of detail to go through, which I won't try and go through now, but we are publishing updates on progress on our website. I think we published two updates so far. We're about to publish a third, and I refer people to, to, to those because certainly um, we know that London is such an intense um, demand for boating. We want to try and find whatever way we can to, to help uh, mitigate and, and, and support that. And it's because of that dramatic growth in boating that we've seen really going back 10, 15 years or more that we've taken uh, the step of having uh, a further consultation around how we might uh, manage this. Um, I mean, I know since I've been in this role for since 2013, I'm regularly asked what the trust is doing as the numbers of boats moving to London increases. And although the London Morning Strategy was a part to address that, it was only ever really going to provide some uh, ways of mitigating the current situation and for it to be sustainable we believe that more is needed you know the morning strategy alone would not resolve all of the sort of challenges that that we face in in managing the capital's waterways and just on the point about numbers it's clearly been a very different year with all the disruption from covid but we don't believe boat numbers have declined um I think some of the data that I've seen quoted refers back to the national boat count we did in the spring, which was incomplete this year because it, obviously in the peak of the pandemic, it wasn't possible to do all the surveying. The data that we've seen since then in September suggests that year on year, there has been growth in boat numbers still. And, and whilst I would concede, of course, it's too early to understand the long term impact of the coronavirus, it doesn't seem that the trend in terms of boat number growth has really been uh, reversed at all. And therefore, we do think it's the right time to open up a conversation uh, with boaters, with other stakeholders in London to try and understand what measures we could, should consider for the longer term. So this is very much the start of a conversation. It isn't something we're sort of doing in a, in a rush. We've flagged, I think, in the consultation that we're working towards some sort of pilot of something in the summer of 2021. So lots of time for people to engage, give us their views, uh, very much a listening exercise um, so that we can plan for the future and be responsible. You know, we must have a sustainable future that, that the, the capacity of the London waterways is respected. Um, and we very much want to hear people's views on that. Good. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, now there's um, uh, some questions about the Bridgewater docks uh, at, on the Bridgewater and Taunton from Dave Fear and Tim uh, down in Cornwall. They're, they're really saying, what, you know, why have we, why, what's the rationale for not renewing the lease on the Bridgewater docks? Um, and in giving notice to all the boats, they've got to uh, vacate their moorings in there. Um, 
is, 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 isn't this could be a, a, isn't this a, a loss in some way, shape or form to us? Um, and, and Sue um, from Derby talks about wide beam boats, particularly on the Trent. Uh, and, you know, there are pinch points, uh, as we know, as you go along there. Um, and, you know, are, are, are we thinking about doing additional dredging to accommodate wide beams? But also she's asking, should there not be a mandatory navigator's license um, for wide beam boats to be introduced? So docks and, and boats. Thanks, Alan. Yes, I mean, Bridgewater Docks, um, just a quick bit of background. You know, we don't own the docks. They're owned by Somerset County Council. Uh, British Waterways actually, prior to the trust, took on um, a lease for something like 20 years, I think, which expired in July of this year. Um, and we took the view that with all the other financial pressures that we have, um, Steve provided a little bit of context for that earlier, uh, we couldn't justify continuing that lease arrangement. It was costing the trust more to look after them than the income they generate. And uh, we had to make the choice to hand them back to Somerset. We very much do want to continue to support the Bridgewater and Taunton Canal. Um, very much want to work with the County Council about you know, the future of the docks and ensuring that they are you know, viable, that they can uh, be the potential, as, as the questioner said, for you know, potential attractions for visitors, et cetera, in the future. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't want to step back from that, but the lease came to an end and we, we couldn't justify continuing it. Our commitment to supporting the canal um, remains. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to try and ensure that boats could remain more in, uh, in the docks, but that's very much a matter for the council. And we certainly hope to see boats continue on, on the canal. I'm turning to the question about wide beam boats, and I know that it's not just uh, the Trenton Mersey Canal that I think Sue referred to, where we have seen, you know, perhaps more more uh, use of of wide beam boats. Um, we, the boaters' handbook that we uh, we publish, that we try and get into the hands of every boater, does include a map, um, which uh, attempts to sort of highlight and, and and inform about which waterways are and are not particularly suitable for wider craft. Uh, there's craft dimensions uh, available on our website, again, including those pinch points to uh, guide and inform people. And, you know, we're actually currently consulting on some changes and clarifications to our boat license terms and conditions, which, if they go forward, will be clear on the requirements to ensure that the vessel, the craft, the boat, is not used on a waterway that's not suitable for it. So this is something we've had a lot of input from our navigation advisory group, a, a group of very experienced boaters working with us on some of these challenges, and we're working at, working at, with them at further uh, dialogue on how uh, other measures might be introduced on parts of the waterways unsuitable for wide beams. I mean, our message really is, if you are in a in a wider beam boat, please you know stick to the the, the the parts of the navigation where it's historically been available. Um, you know we certainly see that that historical um, norm is the thing that we'd want people to follow, and we'll do our best to try and provide information and and clarify and support that because we do know how difficult it is for other users and indeed for the operation of the canal when when boats that are just too wide uh, attempt to use them. Of course, we have with the increase in, in perhaps the number of wide beam boats overall, uh, as a result of the license fee consultation a few years ago, started to increase the license fee for wide beam boats. So, you know, again, that's partly to reflect uh, the impact that they have, but that's not at all uh, to do with uh, their use on, on canals that just aren't suitable. Good, thank you. Um, there are some questions on marketing, I think probably because you, you seem to be stood in the middle of the canal with Welby and a dog behind you. <laughs> you? Um, so um, people have asked, um, you, know, what, you know, what's happening with Welby? What are we doing about our sort of marketing? You know, what, what, what's the next stage with uh, Welby? Um, there, there's also a, a, another question from Roger Stocker, actually, who's, who's saying, look, uh, obviously inspired by Zoom and Teams and everything else, is, you know, th there's much wider acceptance of this now. Have, have we considered uh, holding regular regional sort of open meetings, really, to to update uh, and, and take comments and, and um, make those open to anybody who wanted to participate on? So one on sort of well-being and, and, and one be, you know, in the new world of virtuality, you know, is there something that we could be thinking about doing that, that, that enables people to get more access to us in, in a, on a more frequent manner? 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, first of all, I'm glad to hear that uh, there's an appetite for Welby to uh, have uh, further appearances. Um, um, of course, the truth is that uh, this is one aspect of our work that the pandemic has affected. Um, we, we, we did pare back a lot of our planned marketing activity uh, this summer, partly financially, but also partly the context for it. Um, clearly, perhaps not the ideal time to be promoting um, you know, something. So, so we, we are looking to re, uh, reinvigorate our campaigns uh, going through the next few months into 2021. Uh, so Welby will be making, I don't know if a comeback's the right word, because I'm not sure Welby went away, but certainly we'll be returning to the, the forefront of some of our marketing in the months ahead. Um, particularly, actually, our Plastics Challenge campaign, which I mentioned in the, in the video earlier, which has actually been a great way of galvanising local support for, for, for people, particularly, actually, often children, young people, uh, some really great examples of, of people sort of adopting the Plastics Challenge, and we think Welby will be uh, uh, very... Uh, very useful as a way of promoting that. Um, and actually, we're going to be just doing some merchandise. So watch this space for uh, perhaps not Christmas, because I don't think we'll be, be, be available for Christmas, but into the new year, well be merchandise coming to an online shop near you. Um, to take Roger's point, uh, and I, Roger's actually made this point to me separately before. Yeah, absolutely, Roger. We, we have started to use uh, Teams, Zoom, et cetera, for for user group and, and other sort of stakeholder meetings. Obviously, we're using it today, which is uh, you know, one illustration of that. Um, I know the regional directors, some have done sessions already, some are planning. So hopefully, wherever you are, if you want to engage in you know, active conversations about our work and our priorities and, and what we're doing and the future, which we, of course, welcome, then there should be an opportunity to do that, I hope, very much sometime in the near future in whatever part of the country you're in. Good. Um, now a couple of more tricky ones, uh, which is sort of um, Clive Anderson. <laughs> and we know Clive, Clive um, is saying, look, private boats has lost almost four months of, uh, you know, of the year in the most popular period in the spring. And, and, and so what are we doing to compensate them for the cost of lights and mooring um, when there was no service provided? Um, and, and, and with the DEFRA funding review coming along, you know, that, you know, Clive's view is that sort of that sort of gesture would um, get a lot of support for the trust with the government in the boating constituency. Uh, and then um, Marina uh, asked really about, you know, th there's been a lot of, um, uh, she and a lot of people have asked about what are we doing about public tow pass in, in, in COVID, you know, in, she, she believes that, you know, we're, we're actually asking people to go down there um, when actually, you know, what you know, perhaps we shouldn't be doing that. Perhaps we should be more thinking about the people who live along there uh, and um, you know, looking after them. So it's got quite tricky ones, really. One about, you know, what, what, are we going to do anything for the people who uh, couldn't, you know, use the facilities in the in the in the most important times? And then also, it, it, we've have we got it right about having people wanting to walk down our our, our tow paths? Shouldn't we be? A bit more restricted. Thanks, Alan. Um, so, first of all, um, response to Clive. Hello, Clive. Uh, it's, again, it's a question of balance, and uh, I'm in a way concerned that Clive asking the question because I felt that we'd perhaps done quite well at, at that. So, as as, as Boat license holders will know um, we have extended boat licenses uh, for a month. So there's effectively a month's additional sort of free, uh, for want of a better word, uh, boating available. Um, and that was in response to that very, sort of obviously, the most severe phase of the lockdown that we had in April and May. Um, but as the waterways you know, came, uh, were reopened from really about the end of May, I know people couldn't uh, stay overnight away from home until the beginning of July. Uh, the soundings that we took from the various uh, groups uh, of users that we spoke to was that that month's extension felt like it was a, a, you know, a very reasonable position to adopt. Be bearing in mind, of course, that the Trust has had to continue to fund our work to maintain and care for the waterways. And so um, in giving some consideration to boaters' loss of, of amenity, uh, we also were mindful of the need for us to continue to provide uh, the service that, that boaters would need. And of course, 
when one looks at the range of experiences, yes, some boaters clearly couldn't use their boats for, for more than that one month extension, two, three months. But we also know that others were, of course, living on their boats um, and, and actually the different experiences that people had. So it's not really a question of saying, well, everyone had a consistent, identical experience. There are a different range of experiences. And you know, given the position that we're in, we felt that that extension of a month was a reasonable thing to give. And most of the feedback we've had suggests that people, uh, you know, different views, but, but but some certainly see that as a, a recognition of the disruption boaters have had, but still recognising that the trust need for um, the income to care for these waterways that we all want to see sustained for the long term uh, can continue as well. Turning to the towpaths, and this, of course, was the subject of quite intense discussion back in, in April and May. And it was, quite, again, a question of, of trying to find the balance. We did provide a lot of support and assistance to those boaters living aboard, particularly those who were vulnerable, who, who were anxious. And I know there was a, really a lot of good work done by local teams in, in working at, at that local level in providing that support. And, you know, where we had uh, a kind of concentration of liveaboard boaters, you know, we did deliver messages about making sure people were very mindful of those boats, avoid those sections where possible, to pass boats with care where they couldn't avoid that, giving them as wide a berth as possible. And of course, looking at it from the other point of view, you know, the, the nearly 2,000 miles of towpaths, you know, very few relatively that would have had liveaboard boaters on them were providing this uh, really important access to the outdoors, the natural environment, in communities up and down the country. So by keeping towpaths open, but really trying very hard to deliver messages that people should be thoughtful and responsible in the way they use them, we did continue to provide access for millions of people for some access to green space that we know is vital for well-being in such, uh, such troubled times. And indeed, we saw a rise in, in towpath use in many of the places, you know, residential areas uh, during the period, which was a uh, a demonstration of how valuable they, they were. So support the Liverpool boaters, try to make sure that we provided some uh, support and to, to advise people to be respectful of boats, but at the same time providing access to towpathmen. When so many other things were closing down, we think it was a very important um, contribution really to the overall sort of national um, uh, sort of survival through the through the pandemic that we were able to keep towpaths open for people to use. And, you know, there were always going to be within that 2,000 mile story some places where the, the tensions would be more difficult to manage and we tried our very best to provide uh, that management uh, focus and to help everyone get through it and, and I think for the most part that's that's what we, we achieved um, and I'm certainly very proud of the work that all of our local teams put in to help people through that. Um. A couple of sort of final getting towards the end of the questions really one um, from Andrew Greaves is really about electric power boats and um, you know couldn't we uh, use the up to five milli five meters to be included in the portable and powered from naught to less than five meter category because clearly you know it's big in, big impact on the environment and infrastructure uh, uh, and um, is just where we stand on electric I guess and they owe me that's a really interesting question, um, which is, you know, there's uh, what are we doing down in London, particularly new boaters in the southeast about, you know, training, mooring etiquette and considerate boating and how to look after services. Um, you know, what, what are we doing to educate, you know, new boaters, particularly um, in, in, in those sort of areas? OK, thank you. So on the subject of... Um electric boats and, I, and I'm, I'm probably Andrew forgive me won't, won't, won't be drawn be able to comment too much on the detail of um the kind of various categorization so to speak to the sort of general issue you know we do know that that uh, boating is going to be uh, increasingly in focus of some of the um the carbon reduction um targets that that we are seeing apply to transport as a whole um and therefore we absolutely do need to uh, work with uh boaters generally, electric powered boats, uh, providers, et cetera, to find a path that will encourage, support the um, 
the increasing use of electric powered boats. So I'm certainly happy to take away the consideration, as Andrew asked, that you know, we'll consider that and, 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 and give a more considered response rather than uh, just speak to it now. But we do know that um, you know, there are going to need to be big changes you know, not, not next week, not next month, but over the next few years as we respond to um, the targets being set in this sort of national uh, journey towards becoming net zero carbon by, well, 2050, but maybe even earlier dates being being mooted, of course. Um, we are piloting things. So we were, uh, we worked with Islington and DEFRA to pilot an eco mooring zone on the visitor moorings in Islington that will have um, uh, electric power supply um, that will therefore you know, restrict the, sort of the use of, uh, of generators, uh, et cetera, in that part of the city. And we want to see other examples of that sort rolled out where we can. Clearly, we need to work with funders and other partners, and it clearly needs to be something that is genuinely available uh, for boaters and, and conscious that uh, there needs to be some understanding about the needs of boaters. But certainly, encouraging electric boats uh, is something that... Uh, we're conscious is going to be uh, important for that long-term future. And then on, on Naomi's question, um, I talked a little bit about some of this earlier, and I think um, we clearly would encourage, absolutely, support education, you know, better sort of uh, training for people almost, certainly understanding of etiquette and, and, and how, to, how to boat safely and considerately. Um, I mentioned the Boaters Handbook earlier, which, which we provide. We do encourage, we certainly don't mandate, but we do encourage boaters to get some experience before they uh, they take on a, a license, maybe even take a helmsman's course. Um, yeah, we don't have powers to mandate it. The way that our legislation works is really if you have a vessel and you meet the basic requirements for insurance and safety, then we are more or less required to license that boat. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the boat license holder is, is free then to... Um, to use the boat as, as they wish. But we certainly work with boating organisations to promote the uh, the general sort of uh, boater skills, boater etiquette, and we'll continue to pro promote those messages because it's in everyone's interest, I think. And um, certainly if, you, if you're taking a boat licence for the first time, then I would hope people would see the good sense in learning a little bit about um, what you need to do to operate that boat uh, safely and, uh, and in a way that respects other users as well. I mentioned facilities earlier. Um, we do know that the, the ones in those busy urban areas, particularly sort of the inner and central London, are the busiest that we do provide. You know, very active ongoing sort of maintenance and uh, uh, repair to. So we try and keep them in service. Um, and, uh, and clearly, we want to make sure that we provide the right uh, mix of facilities for the future as, as boating usage evolves and changes and, and certainly we're looking at the moment uh, one of the work streams is doing at the moment is to again revisit that and ask the, ourselves the question about what the right balance of facilities provision should be um, as as use of the waterways changes good um, the sort of final cluster of questions were really all about the finances um, and um, you know, two things really. You know, do, do you know? Do one is, do you think we are okay? Um, uh, I think the second one is really to do with uh, if you look at uh, Todd Brook and the investment that was in Simon's presentation. You know, there's there's a lot of capital spend going to be going, you know, out of the trust in the in the next few years. Uh, and and thirdly, therefore, you know, what what are we doing about getting government support for you know things like that, which clearly are you know significant. Uh, spends that we, we, we would probably not have um, been thinking we would have to be doing uh, in that scale in, in, in this period of time. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to address that uh, as succinctly as I can, Alan. I mean, Steve spoke earlier about the kind of current financial position, and I think provided some reassurance that compared with others, the impacts on us haven't been quite so severe. But nevertheless, we've certainly had to um, you know, refocus, rethink, replan some of what we're doing. And particularly when, as you mentioned, there's that very sizable challenge of the, the scale of infrastructure expenditure that we're really going to need to take on over the next few years. You know, we are seeing um, you know, with uh, the climate change impacts growing, I mentioned briefly earlier the impact of, of the winter flooding that we've probably almost forgotten about after everything else we've been through and how much damage that did to our network. Um, we saw what happened in Scotland in, in the summer when you know, the canal 
breached and, and, and kind of closed the railway line for, for several weeks. Um, and this is all just illustrating again that notwithstanding how much care uh, we take to you know, inspect, to monitor, to manage our uh, very old infrastructure, it is very uh, exposed, it's very vulnerable when we see increasing uh, impacts of, of such things. So our message to government has very, very much been, we do think there needs to be this step change in the scale of expenditure and the trust given our, our you know fairly limited finances is going to is going to really have to stretch very hard to find the the funding to do the work to increase to improve the resilience that we really feel is vital over the next few years so we would want certainly to um, encourage government to look to supporting that spend um, because it will bring forward works that um, we think are really quite important to get done over the medium term rather than you know, push it off into the future. We've also got our grant review that I think Clive mentioned in his question. Um, that takes place over the next 18 months or so and will shape our future beyond 2027. And everyone will know from uh, from what Steve said earlier that we you know, receive currently a little over 50 million in annual grants and it's vital that that level of grant funding is continued for the long term. And so you know, the combination of the increased need for higher infrastructure spending, all the other needs that we talked about on this call, you know, the vegetation, the boating facilities, et cetera, et cetera, but a really high impact, um, high risk uh, infrastructure that we manage, the reservoirs, the embankments, the culverts, the cuttings, uh, how we sustain the level of funding we need to, to, uh, to expend on that and ensure that we have the financial strength to see the waterways careful for the long term is a really important challenge. And there certainly is a role for government, both through that grant review process and we think actually through a separate dialogue about how we meet that need uh, over over the over the months and years to come. Thank you. That's that's. I think it's a very good summary of of of, of where we are. Um, I mean, we we've certainly come to the end now. We're, we've got some specific questions which we will pick up uh, and answer. They're a bit more detailed than we can probably cover over here. Um, I hope you found that useful. Actually, it's been you know we've got to continue to do these things and and communicate in in whatever circumstances there are. Um, I, I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. I mean, uh, it has been a very um, tough year for everybody. Uh, our people, our volunteers, and our supporters have been amazing through this. Um, I, I actually think you know relative to a lot of organisations, we've come through it well, uh, and that's a reflection on the resilience of our people. Uh, and the resilience of our volunteers and, and our supporters. You know, we, we are a very resilient community that's come together to try and, you know, get ourselves through in the best way possible. We've learned a lot along the way. And of course, there's lots of other things that we just have to do as our normal days work, uh, business as usual, which have had to continue to happen. All of the works, all of the towpaths, all of those things have been going on at the same time. So, you know, I can't praise people enough for you know where we are. Um, and I'd, I'd like um, also to say that, you know, the trustees are very, very focused on the future. Um, you know, nothing has changed, really. You know, we're, we're a water be waterways and well-being charity. Um, I, I think the stuff you saw from Heather really shows the impact that we have in the wider community, the wider society on health and well-being, which has never been as important as it is today. So I see the role of the trust in the communities that we're in growing and becoming more significant, being more important. Now, that'll put us under more scrutiny, but that's a good thing because that means we'll have to perform better in the mix. So thanks very much for joining us today. I also want to say uh, thanks to Gemma and Sam, who you won't know who we're talking about, but they're the people who behind the scenes have put this together, have been messaging um, uh, both, uh, both of us as we're going through this, you know, sifting the questions and putting them through. Uh, and without them, this wouldn't have gone uh, as smoothly as it's done. So, Gemma and Sam, thanks for you too. Um, and thanks for everyone for joining. And above everything else, make sure that you and your families stay safe. Thank you very much and take care. Bye.